I was reflecting this week on my life verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will direct your paths. I landed on the part that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I sat there for a while. You know, trust is one of those interesting things, one of those challenging things. To trust means to believe, to believe in the reliability and the truth and the ability and, and the strength and the character of God. To trust means no matter what's going on in my life or in the world around me, I believe God's got it. Trust is letting go. It's to stop trying to figure everything out. It's submitting to him. And it's letting his purpose and his will be realized in our lives, letting him lead. For me, when I think about it, trust is about um, putting my confidence in God, no matter what. That's been a growing experience for me. It's been something that I've started out taking baby steps and over the years I've been able to to learn to trust more and more because of God and who he is and his faithfulness. So let me ask you, as you come to worship today, what are you coming with? What's consuming your thoughts and, and, and grabbing your attention? What are you trying to figure out and mull over? Will you trust God with it? Will you submit it to him? Will you let him lead? You know, uh, standing here thinking about what's going on in the Ukraine right now and the possible spinoff of all that. And that could be a place of great fear for us. It could be something that fills us with anxiety and worry, something that overwhelms us. But God's got it. He knows what's going on. There's nothing that's a surprise to him. So may I encourage us to come, to come and to trust God with all our heart and not try to figure everything out but instead to submit all our ways to him and let him direct us. May I invite you to come, to come and worship. Take some time with our, with our song playlist and, and just allow the words of the song to fill you with the reality of God's presence and, and to draw you to that place where you trust and where you release and where you submit to him. And as you do that, just allow the Spirit of God to breathe peace into your heart, to quieten your mind, to fill you with the assurance that God's got it. And after you've taken some time to just be with the Lord through the songs, and I invite you to come back as we start our new sermon series on the seven signs of John. Let's pray. Father, we come to worship today. And there's probably many things going through our heart and mind right now that, that can cause us angst and make us worry and maybe add some fear and things that we're trying to figure out and we're trying to get the answers for. And, and we look at the political state of our world and even in our own country and some of the unrest that's been there. And, and God, um, it can be a place where fear takes its root. This morning, I pray. I pray that you would draw us all to that place where we can trust you with all our heart. That we can release to you all those things that we're mulling around in our mind and trying to figure out. And instead, we can just submit everything to you and let you lead us. As we come here today, may we come here with a heart 
ready to re receive what you have for us. And may we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. This Wednesday is the beginning of the Lent season. And Lent is a season when we commemorate and, and, and focus and observe the passion and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's the, the 40 days that lead us up to Easter. And in these days, we, we turn, uh, turn our hearts towards repentance and to an, an increased intensity of prayer. And, and, and it's a time to make Christ's death and resurrection more central in our lives. A time to grow and to be strengthened in our, in our faith as we focus on Jesus. This year, I, I'm hoping to help us. To help us walk in this Lenten season by looking at the seven signs of John. The seven signs of Jesus in John, I should say. And so as we look at those seven signs, we start to see Jesus and discover who he is and, and what he's about. And, and we start to realize truth about Jesus that helps us to believe and have life in his name. As a matter of fact, in, in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John says these words, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. As we begin to go on this journey of looking at these seven signs, we look at them so that we can see, so that we can see clearly that Jesus is the Son of God and we can believe in him. And as we believe in him, we can experience the fullness of the life we have in his name. I think it's a magnificent thing for us to go into this Lenten season looking at Jesus through the signs that John talks about. Let's jump right in. Let's jump right in today by going to the first of those signs, which are, which are found in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Let me read that to you. On the third day, a wedding took place in Canaan and Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them right to the brim. Then he said, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you've saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs which, which, through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. John starts out his gospel in a very unique way, unlike any other of the gospel writers. He starts out by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And, and he talks about how nothing was created without him. And then he talks about how the Word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. And then he, he brings John the Baptist into the picture. And what he highlights about John the Baptist is John the Baptist clearly saying that he is not the Messiah, but that he points out to Jesus and points Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. It's interesting as we read that first part of this, of this gospel that, that there's this reality that's starting to unfold. It's starting to give a very clear and succinct picture that Jesus is the Christ. Andrew one of the followers of John, he was a disciple of John, when John said to him, look, it's the lamb who takes, takes away the sins of the world. 
Andrew went and started to follow Jesus. And as he went and started to follow Jesus, he, he then went and got his brother, Simon Peter, and, and they started to follow him. And then we read about the story of Jesus calling Philip. And as he calls Philip, Philip then goes and talks to his brother, Nathaniel, and he says, I have met the Messiah. I believe it's him. He's from Nazareth. And, and of course, Nathaniel has his biases and his prejudices, and he says, can anything good come out of there? And then Jesus reveals to, to Nathaniel something that's, that's pretty significant and life-changing. And, and he says to him, you believe because of what I've told you, there's going to be others who are going to believe without those things. And that brings us, that gives us the context of, of where we are. So here, here's Jesus and these four guys, and they're together just for a few days. They haven't been together very long, actually. And, and here they are, Jesus and his four disciples, they attend a wedding in, in Canaan in, in Galilee. And, and Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, was also there as a guest, uh, but, but seems to be in the role of someone who's working with the actual banquet. We don't know if, if the wedding was for a relative and therefore Mary was involved because of that or, or whether they had asked Mary to kind of help supervise the, the details of the banquet. But whatever, whatever the reason was, whatever the context for that was, here's Mary and there's now this dilemma. They've run out of wine. Now, for us, that might not seem to be a big thing. But in that time, to run out of wine during a wedding celebration was a big issue. It was a big issue because, because from a Jewish celebration perspective, wine is essential. As a matter of fact, the rabbi was found to say, without wine, there's no joy. And so to run out of wine was, was a very significant thing. So, so the, here it is, this big issue, one, one that, that could have caused great grief and, and much stress and could have a, a great impact on the newly married couple and their family. And so in light of that, Mary goes to Jesus and she says, there's no more wine. Jesus and his disciples are sitting there at, at the wedding feast and his mother comes to him and says, there's no more wine. It's kind of like, so what do you want me to do about it? Right? Woman, wh why do you involve me? It, my time hasn't come yet, is what he says. But I want us to notice what didn't happen. Mary didn't get in an argument with Jesus and start saying, listen, I'm your mother. I need you to help me with this, and can you... Take care of this for me. I need you to go get more wine. That didn't happen. Nor does it seem like Mary stressed out or got filled with worry or anxiety or, or any of that. What happens is this. Mary turns to the servants who are there and she says, do whatever he tells you. Did, did, Jesus tell her something that we didn't hear? Like, didn't he say, don't bother me with this? That's what it kind of sounded like. And yet Mary in faith believed that Jesus somehow was going to respond to this issue, to this crisis, to this need. So the story goes on and it says, and, and there were six ceremonial pots there that each held 20 to 30 gallons of, of water. And Jesus had said to the servants, fill them up with water. And so it says they go and they fill them up right to the brim. So now think about this. That means that there is now 120 to 180 gallons of water sitting in these containers. Seems like a lot. But now imagine that it's not 120 to 180 gallons of water, but now it's 120 to 180 gallons of wine. That's a crazy amount of wine when you think about it. So here's these six jars. These six jars were jars that were used for ceremonial cleansing. Um, what you may not understand is that 
one of the things I want us to really grab here is, is that the little details that John adds into each of these signs, each of these stories. Sometimes it's real easy to pass over. So for instance, it's six jars, not seven. Seven is the number of, of complete or whole, of perfect. But six was often seen as, as being unfinished and imperfect. These six pots were, were the kind that was used for ceremonial cleansing. Ceremonial cleansing included washing the feet of people as they arrived at the house, but even more so, washing the hands of people before they ate and between each course. So there was a lot of water that was going to be used that day, and it was a lot of water used that day. Now, some commentators want to say that they believe that John used the six pots and, and the ceremonial uh, vessels to, to present the idea that there was an incompleteness, a, a, an incompleteness found in the law and the rituals that the people were trying to, to live out in that day. And, and there was this unfinished cleansing that, that the law just couldn't bring about. There was this unfinished cleansing that was only ritualistic and external. And that may be something of significance here. I don't know. It doesn't say that specifically, but, but here's what we do know. Jesus had these things filled up right to the brim. And after he had them filled up to the brim, he said to the servants, draw some from it and take it to the master of the banquet, the master of ceremonies, basically, the one in charge. And so it says, and the servants did it and took it to the master of ceremonies. And no one knew, no one knew where the wine came from except for the servants, they knew. I have a feeling maybe the disciples did too, because I have a feeling they were watching pretty carefully what Jesus was doing. So this wine is taken and presented to the master of the ceremony, the, the master of the banquet, and he drinks it and, he, and he, he stands there for a moment just marveling at it. And he, he goes to the bridegroom and he says, hey, like, like this is not the way things are usually done. Usually the good wine is put out at first and then as, as people get a little too much to drink, we're bringing out the cheaper stuff. But he says, this is the best wine. the best wine. Hmm. So what is the significance of this? What is the significance of this sign? Well, we could, we could look at the idea of wine in the New Testament, and, and wine in the New Testament represents both the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but also the shed blood of Jesus. So maybe this is a foreshadow. Maybe the producing of the wine is a foreshadow of, of what's to come, of the ministry of Jesus that's going to be seen in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and in the shedding of his blood. Maybe that's, maybe that's what's being realized here. Or some believe that it reveals the coming of the new life in Christ and the fulfillment and replacement of the old. Moving from the ritual to the spirit-empowered life. That's what some people believe. And some people believe that this was, was showing God's power by providing abundance to a real need. <laughs> Imagine... Imagine what it must have been like for that bride and groom. They probably, 120 to 180 gallons is probably more than enough wine for what was needed. Probably an abundant more. So not only was the crisis averted, but now they, they received an abundance that, you know, they could sell some of that, some of that great wine, and, and it would give them a good start on their new life. That, that might have been what was happening. It might have just been Jesus showing the abundance of God addressing the need that was there. Because that's the nature of God, right? 
He's a God who responds abundantly to need. Some believe, some believe that it was Jesus, the creator, revealing his power over creation. In an instant, he took something that would take a long process to bring about wine. He did it in an instant, in a moment. It could be any of these things, really, couldn't it? I don't think we really know. But here's what we do know. Faith and obedience worked together for the miracle to be realized. It took the faith of Mary to say to the servants, do what he tells you. It took the faith of the servants to be obedient to what he said. But it also took the faith of the servants to take that dipper, to take that vessel of, wa of water out of this pot and take it to the master of ceremony. And it being the best wine ever. There was faith and obedience that was necessary for this miracle to be experienced. We know that this miracle wasn't done for fame and recognition. As a matter of fact, it was, it was quietly, quietly done so that hardly anyone knew what was going on. But we also know this, through this sign, through this sign, his glory was revealed and his disciples believed, put their faith in him. This is four guys who've been with him for like probably less than a week from what we can figure out, probably three or four days. And so they were watching and they were wondering, is he the one? That, that was the question back there, right? I think he could be, he might be, maybe. But when they saw what happened, they believed. They believed that he was the Christ. They believed that he was the one they were willing to follow. So as you look at this, as you look at this story, as you look at this account of this sign of, in Canaan of turning water to wine, what do you see? Do you see how God meets needs abundantly? Do you see how, how he is the one who brings new life, replacing the old, the, the boring, the ritualistic with new life in the spirit and in him? M maybe you see the compassion. He was moved to act and to try to meet that need that was there. He was filled with compassion. Maybe you look at this story and you see God, the creator at work, again, creating something magnificent. Or maybe as you hear this, you realize, you realize the importance of faith and obedience to seeing the miracles of God realized. Or maybe, maybe you just look and you go, wow, this is the God who has the power to do miracles. Whatever you see in this story, in this sign, in this account of turning water to wine. May it help you to just sit and marvel a little more at who this Jesus is. May it take you into a place that's deeper in reality of realizing who he is. May it start to, to create that sense of awe and wonder inside you. And may it, 
may it prepare you to more fully discover who this Jesus really is in this Lent season. I pray that the story, the account of turning water into wine will create a wow factor for you where you go, wow, look at Jesus. God bless. Welcome. Let us join together in the celebration of the Lord's Supper using our scriptural ritual today. Hear these words of invitation. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We invite you who believe in him to celebrate and to share in this sacred service. Let us hear the words of Isaiah as he talks about our Lord. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, send the power of your Holy Spirit upon us that we may experience anew the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. May your Spirit help us to know in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this cup the presence of Christ who gave his body and blood for all. And may your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in service to all the world. Amen. Let us hear the words of institution. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, he took the cup and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in memory of me. Amen. Please have your elements ready as we now prepare to receive the sacrament. the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Feed on him by faith as the bread of life. Let him nourish your soul. Let us celebrate. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Drink this remembering that his blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Let us celebrate. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please receive these words of blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.